So good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Rob Walk. I am a founder and co-chair of Princeton Alumni Angels, along with my co-chairs, Lauren Slatimer and Rick Lipkin from New York, and Christine Brumbach from Northern California. I want to welcome and thank each of you for joining us tonight. Uh, for the few of you on this who are new, and we welcome you, and, uh, and who are unfamiliar with Princeton Alumni Angels, uh, we are an educational and networking forum for Princeton alumni and those with a close affiliation to Princeton University who are interested in investing in early stage companies and or learning more about the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem. PAA is a volunteer-led group and is one of the largest and most active alumni angel groups with a network of over 300 angel investors and a broader entrepreneurship community of over 2,000 members globally. Over the past four years, PAA Angels have made investments in, I think we're up to 39 and almost 40 companies, totaling over $11 million. Companies that receive funding gain access to an extensive network of Princeton alumni and mentors. And finally, since last March, we have organized uh, 15 pitch events, community gatherings, entrepreneurship series speakers, PA educational events, and thanks to uh, Paul Meyerson, a great rooftop gathering last August on Central Park South. Uh, before we move to tonight's session, I just wanna highlight a few exciting upcoming entrepreneurship events. Uh, first of all, next week, uh, Thursday evening, PEC and PAA are uh, organizing a virtual startup showcase with six great founders, uh, followed on Friday by a full day in-person PEC organized New York City Tiger Entrepreneurs Conference uh, that uh, Don Seitz and Marie Mann have done a great job putting together a terrific program. Uh, we hope to see many of you there in person in New York. On April 28th, we have our spring PAA virtual community gathering, and we're going to be updating the whole group on our strategy, our finances, and key initiatives for 2022. So we hope all of you will join us then. Uh, on May 4th, we have our next PAA virtual pitch event for general companies. On May 20th, again in person, uh, PEC is organizing a great Reunions Entrepreneurs Conference at Reunions down in Princeton. And on June 7th, we have our next virtual pitch event uh, after the one on May 4th, and this will be a healthcare-focused pitch event. So we hope you'll join for, for many of these exciting events. Uh, tonight's event is part of our ongoing PAA education series. Over the past year, we have organized sessions covering Angel 101 investing, creating IP and value and technology startups, and negotiating and structuring angel investments. Our speaker tonight, Ed Reitler, offers a unique perspective working with startups as both a leading venture lawyer and an active angel investor. Finally, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, Ed's going to speak for roughly 30 to 40 minutes. And we're going to follow that up with a question and answer session. Please put any questions for Ed in the Q&A box and not the chat box, but the Q&A box at the lower right hand side of the page. And we will direct to Ed uh, at the end of his presentation. And now we hope you enjoyed tonight's session. Handing over to my co-chair, Rick Lipkin, to introduce tonight's special speaker. Good evening. My name is Rick Lipkin and I'm a Princeton Alumni Angels co-founder and co-chair, along with Christine Brumbach and Lauren Slatterman and Rob Walt. And it is my pleasure this evening to introduce Ed Reitler, senior partner of Reitler, Kalis and Rosenblatt LLP, a national law firm specializing in venture capital and emerging companies. Ed is a nationally recognized leader in venture capital finance company and fund formation, and angel investing. Ed has a rare multi-dimensional perspective on this area. He's a corporate attorney and a venture fund founder and investor and an early stage company founder and investor and an angel group founder and investor. And those activities include designing, launching, founding and funding dozens of venture funds and hundreds of early stage companies involving more than 2,000 venture, private equity, and M&A transactions. Ed is a graduate of Harvard Law School who clerked in the US Court of Appeals. He trained at Cravath, Swain and & Moore in Covington and Burling. And more than 25 years ago, he launched his own firm, Reitler Law. 
Ed is a co-founder of Reitler Opportunity Capital, the Angel Round Capital Group, and the Female Founders Fund. And Ed represents hundreds of emerging companies and VC funds that include Los Alos Ventures, Armory Square Ventures, Tishman Spire, Sci uh, Safeguard Scientific, Edison Partners, Milestone Ventures, Tribeca Ventures, New Atlantic Ventures, Osage Ventures, FF Ventures, and many, many more. Ed is a frequent speaker and panelist on venture capital and finance, and a guest lecturer at Columbia Business School. Today, Ed will share with us his insights on the 360 degree view, the full circle of early stage investing. And now to Ed. <laughs> Well, that's quite an introduction. Thank you, uh, Rick. Uh, Rick uh, also you know, did mention them, that we were old friends going way back. <clears throat> uh, so thanks again, Rick. You and my mother say the nicest things about me, and I appreciate you both for that. Uh, before I go too far, uh, for those of you who uh, are wondering uh, what am I doing being a lawyer and an investor, uh, I'm a lawyer because my investment activities haven't been so successful that it's enabled me to retire from the law. So I'm still at my daytime job, which is practicing law. But for reasons I'll get into, uh, you can see what a natural evolution it was from <clears throat> practicing in the venture space as a lawyer to becoming an investor as well. So, oops, sorry. The um, experience I've had, as Rick alluded to, has been in sort of uh, all around the venture space. Uh, I got into it, as Rick mentioned, 25 years ago by, um, by starting the law firm. I have previously was at a big firm doing large international uh, M&A deals cross-border and uh, wanted to get into the, the doing something. I always had this entrepreneurial bug to start something. And through lack of imagination, I uh, didn't know what to start. So I started a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a law firm. And um, what was happening at that time, which was in the uh, mid to late 90s, was uh, the internet bubble was rapidly inflating. Uh, and for a startup lawyer who needed work of any stripe, deals were falling out of trees and hitting me in the head, and they were venture deals. And so I wish I could say I got into the tech space because I had a great deal of foresight, <clears throat> but it just it was really serendipitous that we um, were able to uh, start start off in that, and and it grew, uh, it grew really rapidly. Uh, a few facts about our firm and commercial: we, even though we're a smaller firm, we're fifty attorneys. We have uh, offices, our main offices in New York, but we have small offices in Princeton and LA. Uh, we punch above our weight class, so we're often in the top ten on a quarterly basis in PitchBook in terms of venture deals done. And our peer firms around us above and below us in that ranking are usually have well over a thousand lawyers, not all doing venture. Our firm really specializes in venture and, and that's, that's what we do. We've done over 2000 financings in our 25 years. And we probably, about half of those have been on behalf of representing venture funds of which we represent some 50 of them. Rick mentioned a few um, and the other half representing the companies. One of the things that became clear to me, we started off representing companies, but it became uh, clear to me that we, there are a lot of good lawyers out there that offer good advice. And I know many lawyers have come to speak to you all about term sheets and what to expect in venture deals and maybe due diligence. And my, my approach is going to be a little bit different tonight, Rob and Rick, and, and, and thank you. I, sh I should have said up front, thank you both for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here and, and to, to, to be able to share my thoughts with you and, and um, talk to you after, uh, after we go through this slide deck. But uh, I, I, it became clear to me that, that really to be relevant to the venture space beyond doing good work overnight at a good price, that we had to bring other uh, value to, the, to our clients. And one of the first things we ended up doing was forming the Reitler Advisory Group. And that's currently a four person group with two in our New York office and two in our LA office. That group provides non-legal ex business acceleration services to our clients. So primarily in the 
uh, capital formation area and primarily where you all invest in seed and angel stage deals. They also work on the investor presentation materials, due diligence. Um, they do some advisory work on the M&A front. They also work on the fund formation uh, side as well, providing advice. That's a really high value add for our clients. It's free. So the price is right. They're overwhelmed with work. And uh, it's been great. They generate you know, 10, 12 or more deals a year. And, and the firm has really benefited. But more importantly, our clients have benefited from, uh, from their advice. They, As I said, they're not lawyers. <clears throat> they're recovering entrepreneurs, uh, consultants, investment bankers, VCs. But they all share a passion that I share and that my colleagues at my firm share, which is for entrepreneurship and early stage uh, opportunities. And as we started that group, I, I began uh, dabbling in investing. Uh, you may have seen in the chat, chat box, one of my partners, uh, co-founders of ARC is on Mike Kelly. So in 2010, um, I got talked into along maybe with Mike by one of our uh, co-founders who are sadly no longer with us into starting Angel Round Capital or ARC, uh, Angel Fund as we call it. Uh, if you have an interest in it, you can go check it out on our website. We just had a first closing on Fund 3. Um, they, we've had some you know, interesting deals, uh, some great ones, some not so great ones as you have in angel investing. The, the, the niche that ARC uh, has is that it's a member-led fund. So uh, what the three benefits it really throws out to people are education, access, and participation. Education about how angel deals are done, uh, participation in that this is not a managed fund where there's a manager that's actually doing the investing work. This, the, the work is done by members on committees. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I've really enjoyed it over the past dozen years. And and access. So one of the things that I've enjoyed is I've done a lot of direct investments from the opportunities that have presented itself through ARC so that uh, if you really like this asset class, you have the opportunity to go alongside of ARC and put your money to work if there's space available in the rounds. It's not always, but uh, we're the only member-led fund in New York. And uh, I, I don't know this model being used. I'm sure somebody somewhere is doing something like this, but not really aware of it being done in other places as well. Uh, and then I started becoming an LP in other funds. Uh, some of the funds that Rick mentioned, I'm an L LP in, uh, about a dozen of them. And I do my own direct investing as well. And uh, strangely, I've been, I think we've done better in our direct investments than we have in our um, LP investments so far, but you know, TBD. And then more recently, uh, again, I got talked into starting yet another fund, uh, Rock or Rightler Opportunity Capital. That fund is a fund, it's, it's, it's across sectors and stages. So opportunity is really the best way to describe it. It's really based on the law firm's relationship. So if you think about the law firm, it's in part a large grassroots sourcing organization for early stage companies. We get them companies coming into us from other entrepreneurs, from, from venture funds, from people we've touched in the past in various ways. We get hundreds of them coming in every year. Most of them go nowhere. A few of them get financing. A few are still actually have exits that return capital. And then those very few uh, that have something that's really meaningful financially. And Rock hopes to identify those. I sit in some eight to 12 board meetings a month, watching companies, watching the management teams. How do they pivot when faced with problems? Are they coachable? Do they have Integrity um, <clears throat> is a product market fit. More on all that later, um, but that's what Rock does. Rock looks to find companies that are about to have uh, really large inflection points and go up in that proverbial ho hockey stick up into the right. And um, and then you know we 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 seek to get into very competitive deals using our relationship as consigliere to these companies or to their lead investors and. Uh, we certainly aren't above groveling to get into deals. So we're, uh, we're very good at that, actually. <clears throat> and I thought I'd talk a little bit about the market that we're all sharing here, um, that uh, there's some things about the market that you, you prop, some of you may be aware of if you read the PwC reports they put out on, on venture investing. But uh, this, this particular chart comes from PitchBook. If, I don't know if um, 
PAA subscribes to PitchBook, but I highly recommend it. It's got a lot of really useful data. But the important thing is from this, you can see the angel and seed markets nationally have really grown. They quadrupled over the last 10 years from 2.5 billion uh, deployed to 11 billion last year. And uh, that's, uh, that trend doesn't seem to be abating. Uh, you know, there's some worries or too much capital chasing too few good opportunities. And my experience is that I, I don't think so. I, I mean, I, again, check with me and our funds six or seven years later, we'll see how we did. But just they're, they're at, at first, second and third appearance seems to be a tremendous amount of value creation going on in the Northeast, um, particularly in the, the um, you know, tri-state area. And uh, <clears throat> it uh, seems to be accelerating that, that opportunity uh, for deploying capital into useful projects seems to be growing and not, not staying static or, or shrinking. Speaking of small, I and mean, most angel deals are relatively small. So uh, we're not, we, we, Rock will do later stage deals. ARC will do deals probably more akin to what um, PAA will do more in the seed stage. I will say that Rock just invested in one of your deals, Serotype, and we're very bullish on Emily Stern, the CEO and, uh, and the company itself. We think the technology is great, real green sprouts with the safe financing that we all just invested in. And we're hopeful that, uh, especially in the psychedelic drug clinical trial area, that she'll have some big success. She got her first contract from a big MCRO recently, and um, her financing was slightly bigger than this. You can see most, most deals are done below $200,000 in the angel stage, but uh, certainly um, uh, deals like Serotype happen as well. And, and are frequently angel deals are, are getting larger and larger. I often say that the Series A today is Interfather Series A. What was a Series A 10 years ago? Might be four or five million dollars at a 12, 16 pre. It's often now 18, 20 million dollars at a 60 pre. So everything's gotten bigger, including seed, including angel. And, um, and I think it's just the world we're living in. There's just more capital being deployed in the space. Uh, this chart shows mostly that, uh, at least at the smaller stage, most capital deployed by investors like us goes in in the initial financing and less in later stage. As you can see, as the deal, grow, deal size grows, there's more capital deployed at later periods. That just seems to be intuitive. Who are angels? Well, um, you can see under special affinity groups, a very prominent uh, angel group, Princeton alumni angels. Uh, but they, they really come in various stripes. There are a lot of solo angel investors that are very active and deep pocketed like Eric Schmidt, uh, Chris Saka, Ashton Kutcher, Steve Nash, the Brooklyn Nets coach. Um, there, there are uh, plenty of angel groups around. Uh, New York Angels uh, being a very prominent old one in New York City. And, New York, and by the way, it's, some of these are kind of arbitrarily uh, cached here in that New York Angels also has a small uh, committed fund like ARC. And uh, likewise, under Angel Fund, you'll see Golden Seeds, which also has a very large um, uh, angel network as well. Uh, Springboard would be another angel network under um, angel groups that also has a fund and, and like Golden Seeds invests in women-led uh, businesses. The incubators and accelerators are putting out a tremendous amount of capital. Everyone knows Y Combinator, uh, home of the safe. They, they um, uh, develop that, that form of investment. Techstars is, is big. ERA, sort of local to New York, unlike Techstars and Y Combinator, but, but also very prominent. We just worked on a very large exit in an ad tech company called Triple Lift, which was the biggest uh, success to date uh, of, of ERA when they sold to Vista. And uh, we were all very excited for, for the team there when that happened. There are also um, micro VCs, and these are VCs that are managed funds, unlike ARC, uh, more like ROC. Uh, Overton is one, I'm, I'm an LP in Start Fast. Uh, and then family offices are, are very active in the space. And they also, family offices are also, uh, they're, they're also probably, if you ever think about raising capital into a micro fund or a seed fund yourself, they're, they're a great source of capital for funds. They are the, really the holy grail of raising capital at our stage. If you're raising a fund from 20 to $50 million, institutional investors are really too large to put capital to work in a fund like that without without dominating the, the LP base, which they don't like to do. So you, you, you would go to family offices and there are plenty of them in the New York area. 
Oh yeah, uh, Joyce is mentioning crowdfunding. That is playing an increasing role in our space. Um, still, they're they're not um, they're uh, they haven't really replaced managed funds. Uh, I find personally that uh, the the companies that tend to gravitate to crowd funds are those that uh, couldn't get into the smart money funds. Uh, not that crowdfunding is dumb money, but uh, I, I find the lower quality deals tend to gravitate to the seed invest and angel lists of the world, but not to malign them. They play an incre they're playing an increasing role. And I expect uh, that, that they will find a way to build their brands and, and um, better compete with the, uh, the branded funds that are managed. I, uh, one of the things I didn't mention on that sort of little circle of things that we do in our ecosystem is we host an event called VCs on Skis. Uh, some of you have been to that event. Um, you know, if you, if you can, and you can get there and uh, get our advisory group to give you an invite, it's a worthwhile uh, ticket. One, we had a very prominent uh, uh, crypto investor speaking and, and she was talking about crowdfunding and that VCs were dinosaurs and she wore a hoodie that said VC is dead and spoke to our audience of you know, dozens of venture fund general partners and proceeded to be one of our more controversial uh, evening speakers, but, but it was a lot of fun. And she predicted that crowdfunding would make uh, venture fund general partners obsolete. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, I don't know that it will. Uh, I think there's always room for smart people doing smart things, but you know, uh, something to watch. Now, what are, what are we investing in? Uh, these never surprised me when I saw them in the angel funders report that so much seed and, and, uh, and angel capital is going into price rounds, which would be the, the chart on your far left, uh, the, the columns on your far left, or convertible notes. My experience is a lot more safes going on. And I really like safes as an investor because even though they don't have all the protections of convertible notes, they're fast, they're easy to do. There's not as much friction getting in. There's less transaction costs. I don't like them as a lawyer because I get paid less to do safes. But as an investor, I really think they were an ingenious uh, invention by Y Combinator, and uh, they, they're increasingly prevalent. They, they started on the West Coast five years ago. You would have heard angel investors say, I don't know what the safe thing is. I'm not doing that. Uh, give me a convertible note. But in increasingly, investors here have come to accept it. And uh, uh, the Serotype deal that we just recently did together uh, was a safe, and we, we have no problem with it, nor do very prominent uh, seed funds like Lair, Hippo, or LHV, Primary, first round, they're all investing in safes. And I think it's just uh, with entrepreneurs having so much, there's so much competition by capital to get into these deals. Uh, I think investors have to be somewhat flexible and meet entrepreneurs where they are. And safes are more entrepreneurial friendly. And I don't wanna to go too far down that rabbit hole, but there's no, unlike a convertible note, there's no maturity date or interest rate on safes. And that, that can make a big difference um, for, for investors in some cases. So what do we look for? I mean, what are we looking for as investors? Uh, we're all looking for that black swan. Sometimes we even get them um, every once in a while. Uh, but I thought before, I, I wanted to contrast, you know, this asset class, Angel, is, as you all know, because you've been, you're, you're, you've been doing it, it's highly speculative, right? You're investing in companies that don't have a much of a track record. There's not much to go on. We're going to go into what I look for in, in deals personally. In a, in a few minutes, but uh, but I wanted to contrast it to later stage investing. The Kauffman Foundation put out a seminal report uh, a dozen years ago or so, and the byline line was, we've met the enemy and it's us. And they, they really, uh, and they put out an angel report a few years later, showing that angel funds and angel groups were returning a great deal more uh, than, than venture funds, which have these professional managers are getting paid the high fees. Many angel groups don't have any full-time professionals and many angel funds are too small to really generate enough fees. ARC doesn't generate enough fees to uh, pay a full-time uh, investment professional, nor, nor does ROC. ROC doesn't even pay management fees. It's all done. We're all volunteers. But you can see from these returns on, on, on this slide that the Kauffman Foundation, which is a massive foundation uh, that that invest in venture, invest its capital in venture funds. You can see that it's, it's DPI or, or you know, it's a net cash return, cash on cash return. And its portfolio is only 1.31%. Now I view a reasonable return 
for a venture fund to be about 2.5 DPI to give you the, the return that compensates you as an investor for uh, the lack of liquidity for the extra alpha or risk in, in their portfolio and, and, and you know, gives you some premium for those things over the S&P 500. And so to me, that's, you know, a high teens IRR or, or a, you know, DPI over a 10 year fund of around 2.5. And you can see the Coffin Foundation, which is a real pro at putting money to work in venture funds and venture managers only generated 1.3. And look at these other numbers by these other uh, employee uh, retirement boards. And look at the New York CRS, which invests in many of my clients at the bottom, New York State Retirement Plan. It's, it's only gotten its money back from these venture investments. What, what, what kind of a return is that? And if you look on the right, if you look at the DPI on the right, you'll see that uh, most funds don't return capital. Right? If, you, if you return capital, you're in the top 50% of all venture managers. Congratulations. And then like the, you know, only the top third return, return between one and two X. And then when you get into the top, uh, you know, 16% have DPIs that are worth talking about. And and I'm, I, I, there's some funds around and that we've had, six, seven, X, eight, nine DPIs. They're extremely rare. They do happen, but they're extremely rare. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I think if you can, as a manager or as a group, as you, as an individual in PAA, if you look at your portfolio over a 10 year period and you can, you can have a 2.5 DPI, you're doing well because I think you're beating the S&P 500 and you're being, and you're rewarding yourself or being rewarded for the lack of liquidity and for the risk that you took. But as you can see, the, the you know the Angel Capital Education Association shows that the average venture deal returns 2.6 in three years. Now that's a little bit misleading because most venture deals fail. As you can see, the lower than one x over 50% of venture deals don't return their capital. But what the, what's skewed because you have these huge deals like Google or Alphabet and and Meta, Facebook that return over 30x or over a thousand x in some cases. Uh, SoftBank likes to invest in those deals at much later stage. They kind of make up those black swans make up a lot um, for the, all the zeros in your portfolio. And we'll get into portfolio construction later, but it really, you really do need to have a diverse portfolio to be a successful angel investor. So here are some of the other findings that they, they, they tout. And we're going to talk a little bit about what I will look for, as I mentioned, but that, that due diligence really does matter. You know, some things it's not all just luck. You actually have to do your do your your homework. Uh, Arc and Rock both put out investment memoranda for every single deal uh, before the investment committee, or in the case of Arc, the, all the the whole membership votes on it. Uh, but you can see the difference in the multiple that comes with diligence, uh, experience in a particular industry. So having some context around um, around uh, a deal helps. You know, and I'll, and I'll also add to that thought parenthetically that. When, we're, when we at ARC uh, get a referral for a deal or a deal comes into our, our, our platform website uh, that is from California or Texas, uh, you know, it's got a little higher hurdle for us because we're wondering in places, especially like the Valley, where there's so much capital at work, why couldn't this company find capital there? Why are they coming all the way across the country to us to look for capital? Um, and there may be a good reason for it, but it's a question we have to get comfortable with. Uh, there also is some uh, alignment between engagement by the angel groups after the investment, trying to add value. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then, and then, uh, you know, this is where I want to talk a little bit about portfolio construction. Most, uh, you know, a lot of angels out there who aren't part of groups like PAA are just getting things that come across, you know, some, their neighbor, their college roommate, uh, you know, somebody in their, their synagogue or church or comes to them and, and says, oh, I've got this great deal. It's the best thing since sliced bread. It's hot, hotter. It's going to be hotter than Meta, hotter than Alphabet and Amazon. You got to get in on the ground floor, uh, sort of like in the, the graduate, you know, when the guy says plastics. Um, don't take rifle shots like that. You, you really, in mo most fund managers believe that a proper portfolio construction should consist of somewhere between 17 and 20 uh, investments. And, and the, the, one of the things the Coffin Foundation report on angels shows is that more times up the plate counts rather than bigger swings at fewer opportunities. Because if you're gonna get 100X on something 
or hopefully a 10x, which is really more realistic than what we're shooting for, then that can really go a long way to making up for uh, the zeros that you're inevitably going to have. But you need enough at bats. You need enough shots to get to that potential 10x and really need several 10x's or, or, or at least you know, a number of five to seven X's to return capital before you start getting into the profit on a fund. So how do we exit? Well, as you can see from this chart, uh, most of the exits from last year were in SaaS and health tech, but how we're exiting is, is really dominated as you might expect by M&A events. It's not, the IPOs are rare. Uh, we, we had uh, IPO investment that we were very fortunate about uh, that we'll talk about in a minute, but um, you really are shooting realistically, uh, you know, putting SPACs aside, the SPAC craze kind of came and went. Um, it's really for private M&A events. So I know that marketing for this said that there was a secret sauce that I was going to tell you uh, the ingredients for, and I don't want to say that that we engage in misleading marketing to get you guys to tune in, but there is no real secret sauce. It's it's actually just hard work. But if I had to say that there was one aspect to being a successful investor that I've experienced in in my own investing and in uh, being counsel to uh, some very successful funds, it's relationships, it's networks, it's relationship building. Uh, and that's, that's critical for sourcing deals. That's the most important thing is getting into the best deals, which are often highly competitive. How do you get into those deals? It starts with having that value add, uh, which is the next item here. I, I gave it 10%. But it starts with having the brand and the relationships, to entrepreneurs to, to other VCs, to be able to get into those, those hard to get into deals. If you're, if you're always out there, I mean, there are, there are these stories of these great stock pickers, these great venture fund investors out there who find these, they turn over stones in Nashville and in, uh, you know, uh, Durham, and they find these, these diamonds in the rough. And there are, there are great companies all over the country. But those, you know, the, those are, those are you, you, you have to be a bit lucky to get those and develop them into winning companies, because I'll get into this a bit later there, as, as the venture fund industry has a way of anointing winners by the, the funds coming together and throwing a lot of capital, creating 800 pound gorillas within certain verticals that then tend to scare off the competition because they've got so much capital, they're really hard to compete against. How do you get into those highly competitive deals? Relationships. And that just takes a lot of work. It takes being out there uh, you, you guys do this with your meetings and your events, your networking, um, having Princeton as a, uh, a reference point for your group is very helpful. But there, there should be something uh, in the case of Rock, it's, it's our law firm that, that you know, we have the relationships with our, our clients and funds and entrepreneurs. In the case of ARC, we have the broad network, which is sourcing through 75 plus LPs. Um, in the case of Princeton, you have your alumni network. But that is critical to this, a lot of the, much of the success we all have in this space is due to that, that component, our relationships, and our networks. But you can't just be about, about who you know. You, you actually have to be able to add value post-investment. Uh, and that comes with, I think team building is, is, is important. Um, helping, helping them with tech development, whether it's here or in Eastern Europe or, or India. Um, introducing them to key professionals. I mean, I, uh, I, no one likes lawyers, but um, you know they they can they 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 can be helpful. Investment bankers, venture bankers, all important expertise to bring to companies once you're on the board. Um, you know, I, I'd add uh, to that instilling corporate governance, uh, you know, the, the discipline of meetings and establishing KPIs. Uh, so that we can measure progress in companies. All of that uh, can be very helpful and, and, and can be added. You don't have to be on the board to add those things, but you do need access to the management team. Sometimes our investments are too small to, to get the attention of management teams, but when we're large enough, uh, the, you know, we're, we're investing in a syndicate that's large enough where we can collectively um, uh, be relevant in terms of our capital importance, we can, we can add that value. And I think that's very helpful to our, portfolio companies. 
And finally, an, an ability to listen uh, and collaborate. I think a lot of venture investors spend a lot of time uh, pontificating from on high about how companies should run, but we're not in the trenches, right? Our management teams are there every day. They're doing the hard work. They're not getting paid very much for it. They're equity rich and, and cash poor. And we count on them to spend long hours and time away from their families and, and friends to build businesses that will help make us all uh, wealthier. So I always, I always encourage my team to ask how they can help. Just ask every, every board meeting, if you're in board meetings or any interaction you have, if you're not on the board, be a board observer or just meeting with them once a quarter, ask how you can help. Often the companies will send out quarterly updates where they have their asks, read those asks, see if you can help out with team members or bringing investors to the to table for their next round um, or introducing them to anybody of strategic value like uh, uh, customers. You know, of course, everyone wants customers. I had one um, company that ARC invested in that was a client of mine who gave me a great compliment. He said that when the car stalls, I get out and help push. And I thought that was a wonderful compliment. I really appreciated that. But that's how all investors should be, and lawyers for that matter too, that we really should be out there finding ways to help our portfolio companies and not just sit back and be passive investors if, if possible. And one, one last thing on that uh, in, in the collaboration, if you can get involved in the budgeting process for a company, because you'll learn so much more about their needs and how they're going to spend what capital they have and their projections for the revenues and sales. And as you build the budget, you can really see how the, how the management team thinks about their, their business and how they hope to grow it. I think that's a great way to, to sort of get involved with, with, uh, with, your, with your business. So how do I think about uh, companies and, and what, do I, what do I look for? Um, like I said in the beginning of this, if I had the, uh, the sort of a key to that and the one thing that, you know, that always was successful, um, I, I, I don't think I'd be practicing anymore. But, but I think because we're investing so early, it's got to start with the team, the management team. And you really have to make subjective evaluations. As you do this early stage investing, my, one, my partner, one of my partners in ROC and, and ARC is Terry Ho. Um, he's on a board call tonight. He couldn't be on this call. But uh, T Terry is a long time, was a long time general partner of Lightyear, a prominent late stage buyout fund. And he, what he did, the, did at, at Lightyear is much more quantitative and objective than what we do. We have to figure out things without a lot of track record. So we have to figure out was there's a, what I call the founder opportunity fit. Is this founding team based on their past experience and their, and their interests and their capabilities? Are they the right team to execute on this opportunity or solve this problem? That's probably the biggest thing I look for. Do they have the real shot at solving this problem or, 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 or exploiting this opportunity? Can they drive to scale? Um, you know, do they have management skills? That's, that's a little harder to figure out too when they're only a couple of founders and maybe that's it. Um, do they listen? Are they coachable? Uh, if they're arguing with you a lot in the investment process, then you probably, you probably, it's probably a good sign to know that they're not going to be very open to your ideas post money. And maybe this next bullet, integrity, should be right at the top. Maybe it should be its own category. If you, if you don't feel like you've got a team that you can trust and it's going to be honest with you when there are problems, then we have nothing else to talk about. Integrity is everything. If your management team is running short on that quality, then I, you know, Ryan, I just did a, was doing a diligence on a company for a venture fund, and and uh, you know, we found some basic lawsuits that this uh, company had been involved with, and I, I I sent them the pleadings to my client, and my client said, "Well, you think this is a problem?" I said, "Look what the judge has written about this particular entrepreneur. He calls him a fraudster." says he lied in court and committed perjury. How, why are we having any further conversations about whether this is a viable candidate for investment? I think that's the end of it. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I sit in so many board meetings and one of my pet peeves that just drives me nuts is when I listen to a management team where there's bumps in the road, they're having problems, they're not executing, they're not managing to plan and there's no accountability or ownership. They don't take blame for what's happened. They point fingers, they do like the scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz 
And the, you know, it's it's the investor's fault for not giving them enough capital. It's the market's fault. It's just it's that they they you know I I always want to see in my team at my firm in myself in in you know my portfolio companies in my colleagues at the funds. I want to see some accountability. I want to see ownership. If something's not going well, say I I'm not doing a good enough job. I've got to do better. Here are my ideas of what I need to do better. What do you think? And let's let's roll up our sleeves and fix it instead of doing the blame game. It's just, it's just you know, board time is precious and blaming people is not very helpful. As I mentioned earlier, market opportunity, TAM as they, they, they call it, um, you know, that, that's, a, that, that's a, you, you're really looking for an opportunity where hopefully at this early stage, you can, in my view, generate 10X returns. Um, and that, that has to do with the size of the market, um, you know, you've got, you've got to make up for the losses in your portfolio. So if you if you don't if you can't sort of project out to the enterprise value of the company growing 10x within some reasonable period of time, five to seven years, it, it may be a good company. It may have good fundamentals, but it's probably not a good investment, at least for the returns we're looking for. Again, to make up for our losses. And then while we're at, you know, things that you need that I look for, because we have such little capital as seed investors, you know, ARC and ROC or micro funds, a lot of those funds in that slide I showed you back there have less than $20 million per fund in capital. And so you've, you, you can't, there's not a lot of money in reserve for follow-ons. ARC and ROC both have do follow-ons as, as any angel strategy should, but you've really got to have a capital efficient business. One of the, uh, one of the, one of the companies that I invested in, a colleague of mine introduced to me, I took on his word to invest, which was, I guess, foolish in hindsight. It was a healthcare company that IPO'd. And so I was very excited to hear that IPO'd. I got, um, you know, shares went to a broker, Montauk Securities or something like that. So I, I got a phone number and I called the guy up and I said, uh, you know, I got my brokerage statement and it said that I had, a, uh, you know, I knew what I put in. It said I had about, you know, 25% of my investment uh, you know, I'm out in the brokerage account. I said, well, this must be a mistake. I must be missing a zero here because this says I actually lost 75% of my investment in a company that, that I PO'd. How could that be? Uh, so I called the broker and said, no, no, you got it right. And so I, I said, how could this be? You know, this was supposed to be one of those few successes that I PO'd. Well, the company wasn't capital efficient. It was a, it was a drug company that uh, went through many iterations, didn't get its first blessing from the FDA and had to go through several clinical trials. And there were like seven or eight rounds of preferred stock on top of my round. And I got crushed. I got diluted to smithereens. So that happens. We, we don't have a lot of capital to protect our position. So one of the tenets of Rock, which is a little more opportunistic than ARC, is that it tries to go into rounds where there's a solid lead investor that will protect that round. And you know we'll reserve capital to, to protect our position. But, but more, you know, mostly we just want to be in a capital efficient business and you know, the poster child for capital efficient businesses are SaaS businesses, businesses where you subscribe and it's like the producers, you, you, you make something, you sell it over and over and over again, except it's not fraud like the producers. It's, uh, it's actually a, a legitimate thing to do, which is you create a SaaS uh, software product that you can just let people subscribe to, create a platform and and that's very scalable. Um, and you can always look backwards too as you evaluate a management team. How they spend capital to date. If they've been profligate in how they how they invest, how they spent their capital in the past, query, you know, have they learned their lesson? Will they really pivot and be, you know, much more uh, prudent with their capital going forward? And then of course, you've got to um, assess the product technology. Is the company at product market fit? Is there virility in the growth if, if it is out in the market um you know what what are the early metrics show um how i always look for this how has a company responded to feedback from the market from the customers about what they like about the product how it's being used how can they make it more sticky how can they make it take friction out of the sales process is there a long sales cycle is it you know are they selling to large enterprise and so those are the things that I really focus on that, um, you know, that, that help me to 
evaluate whether uh, I, I, I want to commit my, my capital. Uh, and then I'll, if they have an uh, unfair moat, some sort of cutting edge technology that's going to take some other uh, competitors some time to develop, that, that's always something too. We look for an unfair advantage of, of, of some sort. Uh, we don't want it to all be about all about execution. If they've got some sort of technological moat, that's a, that's a really great thing for us. So um, just talk about a few of our deals that we've done and, and how what I just mentioned, what we look at impacted those companies. Now, I want to zip through this because I want to leave time for questions. Um, Ocrelis was one of our great successes. Arc2 invested in that. And that, that was a company, FinVC just put $80 million to work in it, Bullpen's an investor. But Arc, uh, it, it was sourced by the law firm. It was a, an advisory client, so our advisory team was helping it raise capital, and we were successful. Uh, we were fortunate that ARC got to put money to work, uh, but it really came, this is an example of the network, when I, on that 80%, just uh, the, the, the firm was able to, uh, to get to know Oculus and introduce ARC through the advisory group. We had a very fortunate exit. We sold 50% uh, of our stake for 20x, uh, our position. And uh, that was really a remarkable uh, return for us. And, um, you know, one of the best ones in the ARC family. Uh, Ollie, uh, I mentioned VCs on skis. Ollie was a, uh, uh, we, we, one of our speakers at VCs on skis, Dave Carvajal, uh, recruiter in the, um, the, uh, the venture space introduced us to an entrepreneur who came to VCs on skis and we got to know him and he actually started incubating a company at primary and uh, we followed him and watched him and uh, we're fortunate enough to, for Arc, uh, another Arc2 investment company to put money to work. Uh, Oculus should have mentioned is a uh, optical reader that evaluates information in credit card applications and insurance applications. So it's got a big, it's a big FinTech company and it's growing rapidly. And uh, We're still riding 50% of our investment there. Ali, makes dog food, uh, high-end gourmet dog food. It's a subscription business. And uh, that company, uh, we, we followed through uh, a CEO change. It's backed by Canaan and Primary. Uh, and it's uh, also doing very well. And we're, we're gonna uh, hopefully have a great exit there. Rhino, another FinTech company. Uh, there we, we found a, you know, the, a founder opportunity fit. Uh, the, the, one of the founders had a family Real estate business, Rhino has a product that um, is a substitute for renter's insurance. So in big cities, if you've got kids or if you remember when you first came to a big city, the, the deposits for apartments are very high, especially in multi-bedroom apartments, too high for many younger uh, people to coming out of college to, to afford, often tapping parents or uh, relatives for the capital to do that. Rhino has a very low cost monthly insurance premium paid for an insurance product that reimburses the landlord for a broken lease or damage to the apartment in lieu of the deposit. So it's just the premium is tacked on to the rent in a landlord's monthly platform. And it takes away a lot of the friction for younger people to rent apartments and not have to come up with the cash for a big deposit and have it tied up for, for, for the duration of the lease. That company has uh, Tiger Global and but that's an example of them waiting. Oh, yeah. And Joyce is telling me that much, like I mentioned, the venture industry has kind of come together and anointed that as a winner. It's taken on a tremendous amount of capital and, and kind of pushed other competitors out of the space by just being well financed and, and being able to market and sell and become the dominant player. It's backed by Tiger Global, is the, probably the biggest name in, in Rhino. And uh, I don't have any inside baseball knowledge in it, but we, we hope that Rhino will, will go public. Um, Hone is a uh, e-commerce company, it did much like uh, All Eats DTC, direct to consumer. Again, that's a uh, example of an entrepreneur we knew much like an Ollie. Uh, we followed, he was the, Saad Alam was the founder of SiteLighter, an ed tech company that failed. But much like I said earlier, it's not just, you know, uh, I think, Venture stage companies can command a premium on their pre-money valuation with rock star entrepreneurs who have exited successfully before, not too successfully because they're not hungry anymore. But uh, Saad, I think you can also make a case for entrepreneurs who have exited not successfully, but learned from their prior deal 
And I think EdTech is generally a very hard space. Uh, but Hone is a uh, company that markets uh, wellness to, to men. And, and one of their premier products is uh, being able to test for testosterone levels and being able to do a subscription business, uh, prescription business online and, uh, and sell, um, sell their products to, uh, to people direct to consumer without having to go through a retailer, like a, you know, a vitamin store or something like that. And they're doing really well. Tribe is the lead investor. Tribe came out of uh, uh, social capital. Uh, it's a very prominent fund in the Valley. ACV, one of my best directs, uh, Joyce and I, we invested in that. Uh, that's an example of uh, networking through one of my very dear friends uh, and good client, Somak Shodapaje, founded Armory Square Ventures, which in turn I and introduced him to that opportunity when it was being formed and he just crushed it. Um, the LPs hired him and he's become a, one of the most successful ventures, not just in upstate, but in all of New York, if not all of the country. Uh, but he invested in a, a company out of Buffalo called ACV Auctions, which was an online auction place for um, uh, automotive dealers for their cars to trade. And that was previously done by fax and, and phone calls with brokers. And it's, it tr it's a classic case of an offline business going online and a digital marketplace being created. And uh, you know some, some of the returns on this were spectacular. Joyce and I got into an SPV a little later. I think our return was somewhere around 12X, but still uh, a very good one. That company IPO'd and, and uh, one of our best direct invest. And it is our best direct investment, I think. Um, but not all of our stories are happy. Uh, the three on the right are, are less happy. Advanced DX is an ARC investment. Uh, that was a test for, uh, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that was a test for, um, uh, a diabetes at home test that was reimbursed by Medicare. And what we didn't really appreciate was how important Medicare reimbursement was for the business. And there was a single point of failure. And in the case of Advanced CX, which was doing great, and we liked it very much and had some other quality venture investors, maybe Milestone, I can't remember who else was in it, but uh, it, when Medicare stopped reimbursing for the test, the company folded rapidly and uh, it was uh, it was a lesson well learned. Um, and uh, the next one, I try not to name these companies. And they, they, they are on our wall of shame at Rock and Arc, uh, and, you know, in the halls of the 21st floor of the Lipstick Building. But uh, this company uh, we invested in alongside of Tech Council Ventures and Front Row. It's pretty good investors. Uh, we loved it. We followed, we, we, we met the speaker at VCs on Skis, much like with uh, Ollie and, uh, and many of the other uh, portfolio companies we've seen at VCs on Skis over the year. But it was it's an artificial intelligence company that um, that uh, was supposed to replace help desks with uh, being able to answer say ninety seven percent of the typical help desk questions and and sort of some sort of going offshore for help desk and going no shore. Uh, and the product we think was great. The entrepreneurs were great. It's just a classic uh, uh, example of failure to execute. Uh, our, our team there just could not get sales done, and uh, we we we. We, you know, we, we just couldn't understand why this product wasn't selling more. And um, I think, you know, we all share blame for it, uh, but it's, it's not dead yet. It's made recent progress. We, we you know, but it's, it's been a lot slower than, uh, than we'd hoped it would be. And, you know, that Joyce is making the point that one of the things I mentioned earlier is it, instead of going with an SMB strategy, which might've been better because we could get quicker results, we went large enterprise which the sales cycle, you know, you have to sell through so many constituencies in large enterprise, legal, um, strategic IP. It just uh, it can take a year or more to make any significant progress, and so you quickly run through your capital that way. Uh, as did the next company. Um, it was a, uh, a a very good company. I thought it had a terrific entrepreneur who ended up exiting big uh, in another company to Optum, just not this company, sadly. It's a health as a service company to treat alcohol uh, dependency. And it was backed by um, Canaan and uh, I want to say uh, Oxa Ventures, 406 Ventures. So it had some really good quality VCs. ARC2 went into that one. And, and you know, I, I wish I could call them. I, I was, I, I, there have been companies that have done great that I've never would have thought would have done great. Um, and then companies like this that 
I was really high on and just never made it. And I think the lesson I learned here was that it it, it had one, another single point of failure. It only had, there are only a few large payers in this market. By that, I mean insurance companies to reimburse the consumers of this service because people won't pay out, you typically won't pay out of pocket for this. And we, we, we worked really hard to get Aetna as our payer, but uh, just as we signed them up, they engaged in the merger with CVS became very distracted and we just weren't able to execute with our clients through the Aetna platform. And, and the VCs got impatient, stopped funding it, pulled the plug. Uh, I was still sad about that. I thought the company had tremendous, um, tremendous you know, potential. But, but that's, uh, that, that's it for, for the presentation. So I'm happy to take any uh, questions at this point if, um, well, yeah, like first of all, I want, Ed, on behalf of all of us here tonight, thank you for that wonderful presentation, the insights, the stories, things that went well, things that didn't go well, lessons that you learn. And I, I think you're right. We often learn some of the best lessons from things that don't go well. Uh, but it was a very, uh, really thoughtful and uh, great presentation. So thank you. Uh, for those in the audience, if you put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, we have one to kick off from Rod. Uh, who asked, how does one recognize an early stage black swan? <laughs> well, like I said, if, if I was really good at that, I, I wouldn't be here talking to you guys. 3D so, glasses. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, Joyce says uh, 3D glasses maybe, but um, uh, it, it's, it's, it, I think anyone who tells you uh, that they can spot, uh, I mean, I, I, I tend to be, optimistic by nature. I hope I'm not Pollyannish, but uh, I, I tend to see the best in people and the best in opportunities. And um, I'll, I'll say this about black swans. I only see companies that I think have the opportunity to go deep and big. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we invested in a company called MoviePass, which many of you have heard about. It was a subscription uh, movie service uh, and I, I actually voted against it. And it was one of the few times I've ever been right about something, uh, but I got outvoted. Uh, the reason I voted against MoviePass as an investment was it, Chris Kelly, the, one of the early investors in Facebook, put a tremendous amount of capital into it. And I watched all this capital being poured into it. And I just thought this is really off, off strategy, off, off, off task for ARC. ARC does not have the kind of capital to keep up with this type of project. This needed massive amounts of capital to purchase tickets so that we can get to the, the amount of volume to uh, be able to make a profit. And, you know, we were buying the, we were, we were getting the subscription money in and losing money because we were, didn't have enough money to pay for all the tickets these people were purchasing with their, you know, eat as much as you can menu for the movie, for the movie pass uh, model. And, uh, but, but one of the things that was said in our meetings when we were considering movie passes, this could be huge. And I agree with that. It could have been huge. Uh, just the scale of it. It was, it was national and the idea of it. And you occasionally see companies that, that really are big ideas. And then if they're going to work, will be big. They often also come with tremendous amount of risk too, because they often aren't capital efficient. They need a great deal of capital to scale. It's very rare that you see a black, true black swan opportunity that doesn't need a, a significant amount of capital. So, uh, I wish I could call the black swans. Uh, they're uh, they they do occasionally come by. I mean, I, I guess maybe ACV would be a black swan. And by the time we invested at 190 million dollar valuation in that deal, and so by the time I came along, it had been significantly de-risked. So um, it was a little bit easier to identify that as a company that was going to be a unicorn if that's how you define black swans. But um, I, I I wish I could give you more than that. Uh, obviously, TAM is a huge part of it, uh, which we talked about, but uh, I, I, uh, I, I wish I had the hubris to be able to say I could do it, but I, I can't. I think there's something I did mention in the presentation that comes into play with angel investing and venture. At this early stage, remember I talked about how subjective and qualitative our evaluation was. There's a little bit of luck involved too. You have to be in the right place at the right time and use your networks to get into some something that gives you the best opportunity to see a unicorn. Thank, thank you, Ed. Um, John Wagner and Nicole both had questions about dilution and protecting yourself from dilution. 
John asks, how do you recognize a company that will have to go through multiple rounds of dilution? And if you, if you know this, how does that influence the way in which you should invest and you would argue protect yourself? Yeah, well, depending on the form of security that you go into, you can have weighted average anti-dilution, let's say in a price round. In the case of a safe or convertible note, you'll have a cap on conversion. So to the extent that there are subsequent rounds that, or you know, the, you'll convert it to lower of a cap or a discount, uh, to the extent there are subsequent rounds that either higher or lower valuation to the post money valuation in which you invested, you have these built-in protections often in your security. So in the case of any of you who invested in Serotype, there was a cap on conversion on a, uh, I believe it was a pre-money pre safe, I wanna say, I'd have to go back and look at that. Uh, but the, that, that means effectively that to the extent that the later round gets done at a higher valuation and you convert into that security, you still get the benefit of the cap on conversion. And so you still get the benefit of the lower price which reflects a higher risk in the stage at which you invest it. You, you know, I mentioned earlier capital efficiency. If you see something's going to need a lot of capital and there's going to be a lot of lick pref loaded on on top of you in subsequent rounds, that's a bit of a red flag because you, you can get crushed, much like I mentioned in that IPO uh, where I ended up with 25% of my principal uh, because of the massive amounts of dilution I got. There's only so much you can do as an early stage investor. So I often say this, not only do you have to be right about a company, but you have to be right about a company that's going to exit and, and do so in a way where the rounds are always getting larger and, and higher valuation so that you're not crushed with dilution. And you only get that, that benefit of the cap on conversion once. Then you going forward, you've got the weighted average anti-dilution protection protecting you. But just the, if a company takes on a sheer massive amount of capital, Guess who's going to get re-upped? The management team. Guess who's not going to get re-upped? The angels like you and me. So you all, not only do you have to be right about the company, but you also have to be right about timing. You have to be right about a company that's going to exit without taking on tremendous amounts of capital so that you do have a significant enough portion of the cap table when you exit to be able to be uh, receive a meaningful return. Thanks. And so Eugene uh, Major, one of our very regular and active angels, asked some questions, uh, and I can see where they came from, some recent due diligence rounds that I've been involved with him. But he said, should angel investors, in situations where they can, try to make investment uh, their investment contingent on the company doing things that improve the quality of success? For example, raising enough money in the round to have sufficient runways. So you know, our capital is a predicate on raising 250, 500,000 from other investors, hiring an outsourced CFO, if they have a good business, but weak financial fun function, uh, or finalizing a deal with a prospective employee that they're talking about uh, prior to the investment closing. So what do you think about those contingencies to improve conditions and, and chances of success? Those are excellent points. Um, we often, and I probably should have mentioned that, uh, we often will condition our investments on, we don't wanna be the first money in, right? We want to make sure that um, the deal is significantly de-risked, that we're, 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 we're holding off on an um, investment in a safe right now, a follow-on investment in one of our portfolio companies in Rock. <laughs> it's a $15 million round. We want to see the lead commit first and see that round significantly uh, funded. <clears throat> before we come in, we'll be one of the last investors in. I know that's maybe not what our portfolio companies want, but you know we have a fiduciary duty to protect our LPs as well. And we want to make sure <clears throat> that when we do a bridge financing, like a safe, that's not a, that's a bridge somewhere, not a bridge to nowhere. In terms of, the, uh, of, of conditioning the investment on certain key hires, you see that a lot. Often our investment isn't large enough to uh, move the needle for that. In the case of Rock, uh, as, a, as a small co, both ARC, I should have said also that Rock and ARC are, are really just co-investors. Sometimes we'll be part of a syndicate that has no real lead, but we're, we're not a lead investor. Usually you find that um, leverage really more with a more significant lead. Although uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with PAA uh, getting together and saying, hey, you know, we, we passed that, we've got a quarter million dollars of interest, but uh, you know, they, they collectively agreed that they'd like to see 
a CFO hired, let's say, or or a CTO uh, hired. That there's that I think it's a very smart thing to do when you think it's warranted. Ed, do you want to, you've got some really interesting statistics from the Kauffman Institute. We look at a lot of their data and ACA data, and one was that safes, while, can, while going up in terms of frequency, were still relatively small. And I'd say over the last 12 to 18 months, at least for the companies applying that, or that we're looking at and taking a look and screening, we probably see a lot more safes in that group than that 8%. And increasingly frequently, we see convertibles, we see preferred. But what are the, some, some of the things you would tell investors they should watch out for in safes? I mean, safes are simple, they're cheap, they're Y Combinator templates, that's all great. But from an investor perspective, what are some of the things we have to think about in terms of protecting ourselves in, in those instruments? Yeah, you'll see that the, that that data comes from a report in 2021 showing data from 2020, and you can see that safes are eight percent of all angel deals, up from two percent two years earlier. So you can see they've grown four x in two years. I would say if you did a you know the first quarter 2022. Uh, now that number would probably be up in 30, 40, 50 percent uh, number because I, I see that safes all the time. As I said earlier, if you're not willing to invest in a safe, and that was the position of some venture funds some time ago, and even some angel groups, you're just going to miss out on a lot of deals because you know that seems to be becoming the, the dominant form of investment. So that that slide has got data that's a little bit dated. In terms of what to look for, uh, well, the nice thing about safes are their forms, so they they say the same thing. But what many people don't realize, so beyond the cap and the discount, which are economic terms that can be negotiated, um, there are a couple of things that aren't in the form that you should think about. First of all, there are two forms, and I don't, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that. The original forms were pre-money safes, and they were favorable to the entrepreneur. That was the first form developed by Y Combinator. And a pre-money safe basically is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate uh a pre-money safe is a safe that says that it's conversion caps at uh, $8 million. And um, if you if you have one investor who puts in $2 million, then the post, you know, the the the, the, the post money cap table prior to the qualified equity financing, which triggers a conversion of the safe uh, coming into play, the post money cap table of the safe conversion would be 10 million with a safe converting um, on top of the pre-money valuation. Uh, and the pre-money, you know, the, 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 the pre-money cap table doesn't move. But what's happened recently is that investors wanted to have a, a sort of more favorable uh, safe. And so they developed, Y Combinator came back with a post-money safe, which basically says the post-money valuation is, let's say 10, regardless of how much capital is raised in the safe. So with each incremental dollar that's raised, it reduces the percentage of the pre-money or the post-money cap table, post-conversion of the safe cap table held by the pre-money investors. That's very big. So anytime you're looking at a safe, the, probably once you get beyond all the other fundamentals of the company, you're now evaluating the instruments you're looking at. You should look at, and you get behind the, the economics of the cap and the discount. You should look at whether it's a pre-money or post-money safe. There are huge differences in the amount of cap table, uh, uh, to put it colloquially, what, what happens in a pre-money safe is that all the other safe investors dilute each other. In a post-money safe, they do not. And, and so they only dilute the pre-money founders and other investors. So that's a huge difference in how much of the post-safe conversion portion of the cap table the safe investors own. That's the big thing you should look at. Pre or, do I have a pre or post-money safe I'm looking at? Second thing is that you should know that if you're putting enough money to work, many investors request standard side letters. And what's in those side letters? Well, information rights. So you can, in our case, you know, we have LPs we have to answer to. So we have to have reporting. But beyond that, uh, probably the most important thing you can ask for, for and because there's a truism that VCs want to double down on their winners, you want to have, if, you, if you've got the leverage, you want to have preemptive rights. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that's simply a pro rata right of right to keep your, your percentage stake in the company by investing in the in the next round or even in subsequent rounds too, if you draft it that way. But that's that's inside letters, that won't be in a safe. You have to ask for it. There may be other investors in the round getting side letters. And they don't have to disclose that to you. Uh, you won't know until you ask whether you can be eligible for uh, those types of rights. 
Yeah, thank you. We, we actually have used side letters in a lot of deals and it's very helpful. Um, I have a question about the changing landscape and you referenced a couple of things. So I'm not really thinking about crowdfunding, but when you look at, for example, Sequoia, which just got rid of and blew up the traditional fund model and created sort of a singular permanent structure that's more flexible and sort of like uh, a fund that keeps going. Um, but even more so Tiger Global. So particularly in like digital health, Tiger Global went from 79 deals in 2020 to 335 in 2021, 1.3 deals a day. The first two months this year, two deals a day. They have a team of 30 and they're, they're doing, you know, 30, 40 deals a month. How, yeah. so how does that impact angel early venture investors and how has that changed the landscape for groups like us and for, 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 for like ARC and, and Rock and people like that? Well, uh, it's, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon in some ways. Um, I, I, I'd say it's, it changes it for the positive. Uh, certainly on your mark, your MOIC chart is a fund. When you see for my investment, Rock's investment in Rhino, you see the MOIC. We, Rhino, you know, Tiger came into Rhino uh, three months after we were in at 5X our, our, our price. And so to get a 5X markup in three months was, you know, made us look like heroes. But you know, at the end of the day, what I care about as a manager, as an investor, is DPI. So the MOIC is great. That's money on invested capital for those of you who aren't familiar with the term. Uh, but DPI or cash on cash returns is really what I care about. So I, I view Tiger as, a, and to some degree, Sequoia and, and um, certainly um, uh, the SoftBank fund, uh, Vision Fund, as momentum investors, where they're they're coming in. And they're they're playing in a stage pre in the pre IPO stage, where they're they're taking a calculated bet that a good bit of the portfolio they're investing in is going to move on to the next stage and either have a higher valued private M and A exit or, or go IPO, and uh, that bet seems to have paid off uh, at least uh, for Sequoia Vision Fund. I think we're still a little bit, uh, you know, the, the verdict's not quite in yet. They've taken such massive bets. Um, they you know they. TBD uh, as to how that works out. They 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 couldn't. They I think their first fund was some eighty billion or something like that. Uh, they couldn't raise a second fund quite as big. They raised like another ten or twelve. Uh, I think people are still waiting to see whether this model works. But certainly for us as early stage investors, it gives us the opportunity to get out, uh, like an Oculus where we were able to sell to Fin VC. Uh, it, you can take some money off the table in some of these deals. And uh, and then keep playing as a, with the rest of your your equity almost as a lottery ticket. You're in the money 10x, 20x, and anything else you get is is just gravy. So I, I think it's a it's a good thing. Uh, I, I I say that speculation is never a good thing in any market because it tends to lead to crashes, which is unhealthy. Um, if you one thing I didn't mention in in my in, in sort of a strategy for investing, uh, but m it's much like diversification. I'm a big believer in dollar average investing in any asset class, uh, including venture. So we should be investing through all cycles of the economic term, even when even if there's a crash in, uh, in, in the venture valuations, especially when there's a crash, we should be putting money to work. Some of the most valuable companies of the last decade came out of the ashes of the internet winter in 03, 04. And, uh, and so I, I believe you should never be out of the market. You should always be in the market, riding up and down with the pricing, the pricing does get get pushed up because, you know, when these later stage companies push up valuation, that that increase in valuation comes down to us. So the negative to that for us is that you know we're paying higher values now, we're exiting higher values, but it's all a cycle. The values that we exit at will come down. The values we invest at that will come down. The key is because of the the volatility and the speculativeness of our area of the market. You really want to look for that ability to have a 10x. I wish I could give you the, the secret sauce for the black swan, but it starts with at least it should be a 10x return. Yeah. So um, there are a couple more questions coming in, but Nikki had an interesting one, which is we talk about, you talked about focusing on companies that were capital efficient. On the other hand, you know, we, we, look, we see a lot of healthcare companies and those include life sciences and biotech and getting through one indication, let alone a couple programs through stage one, stage two, clinical, stage, you know, three clinical trials can be very capital intensive. 
So Nikki says, does, does that principle preclude you from investing in say biotech, which is capital intensive, or do you take the view that, you know, if, if they hit good data in stage one, stage two trials are likely to get funded or, or some sort of an exit, how do you look at those sort of capital intensive industries like biotech life sciences? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not a, I, I think biotech can be very, very um, uh, remunerative. It's just, I don't feel like uh, I bring and my colleagues bring the requisite expertise to biotech. There's often a binary result with biotech uh, where, where there's, it's a, you know, a home run or a, or a zero. And even in the home run scenario, because of the massive amounts of capital they take, that, that, that IPO that I invested in, that where I got the 25% upon the public offering, that was a biotech company. And um, I, 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 you know, I, I don't think it's a, I think it's very tough to do seed investing as a biotech. You'll find very few seed funds out there. There, there was one called Carrot Capital that's long gone. I think it's very difficult to do biotech. Where we have done it is where it crosses over into technology and it almost becomes like a hybrid health tech company. So we've invested in a company called Gatehouse Bio, which started as a platform providing small RNA testing results for clinical trial, FDA clinical trials to large pharma. And uh, they're, they had a very unique platform. Serotype is a little similar to that too, where they have a, uh, a software platform that works on hardware for brain imaging and that can give about, can evaluate results of how drugs treat Certain, how drugs affect certain areas of the brain. Uh, but again, that is a SaaS play. They're getting paid for use of their software products. Now, where that gets really exciting with a Serotype or Gatehouse Bio, uh, they're both rock investments, uh, although our fund ARC is uh, in discussions with Emily uh, about investing in Serotype as well, and rock may follow on there as well. But um, where, where it gets really exciting is where companies like that using their technology can partner with the biopharma companies and get royalty payments on the products developed with the results of their testing. That's where we can have a capital efficient business that's not paying up tremendous amounts of money to just for clinical trials and doctors and testing companies and MCROs, but really just providing the software, getting paid for that all along the way, being profitable, yet having this swing for the, you know, the real moonshot of having this opportunity to have a piece of the royalty for these, these, Oh, you know, maybe change the world drugs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things I think our group, both PA and CIF were big backers of Emily and David and, and really like Serotype. Um, Mark Baum had an interesting question. I don't know if you know the answer, but he said, what do you think the percentage of successful exits of companies or will be the percentage of, of successful exits of companies that have reached series B financing? So if you get to series B, what percentage of those do you think would be successful? Like, I don't know if there's real data or anecdotal. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, there, there, I'm sure there is real data. If you went to PitchBook, you could probably patch that together. Um, but I, I, I have some rough stats for all companies that sort of, uh, you know, much like you don't need a license to become a parent, you don't need a license to be an entrepreneur. You just get together with your college roommate and start a company. And uh, many times you probably shouldn't have, but uh, in terms of once you're at the Series B stage, you know, it's also that's a little bit of a, of a broad question because Series B can mean a lot of different things. It can be massive. It can be not so massive. But uh, if I had to peg a number of six, Series B that exit and actually return at least one X of capital, I don't know if that's successful or not, but it's, it's not successful, but at least gets everyone their money back. Uh, maybe some return for the founders. How many of those? I'd probably say, you, you know you, how you can think about that? You can think about a Series B investor. Who would that be? That'd be somebody like an RRE or somebody like um, a Spark Capital or maybe a SJF, yeah, maybe late stage A. Uh, so you'd have to look at them and say, how many of their companies return capital? And I'd say probably 40% or so, you know, return capital, return enough capital to get their MOIC to 1.0. Probably my best. I'm an LP in a lot of these funds. I'm an LP in SJF and Los Olos, uh, EIP, Energy Impact Partners. Um, they uh, and and I'd say at that later stage, it's probably uh, 35, 45 percent. Great. So we're just have time for one or two more questions because I know we want to wrap up at eight thirty. Um, Eugene asks, 
you talk about trying to help companies add value after the investment is made. I think it's something that we all try to do. Uh, do you have any suggestions regarding how an angel group, let's say made up of 10 to 15 investors in a particular transaction, can interact effectively to do this, assuming that the group doesn't have a board seat? What are best practices yeah. to help companies? Post yeah, that's a great question because we face that in ARC too. So ARC is a committed fund. So it's actually one check writer, but it does have uh, many of us, including Joyce and I have gone side by side with ARC in the deals. So our, our impact can be bigger than our initial investment from the fund. But one of the, I think one of the powerful impacts of ARC and PAA and one of the selling points is its diverse group of investors and members in that there always there's somebody in the PAA team. They may not have invested in the company, but somebody that you can reach that has domain expertise that can help make introductions to customers, you know, break a log jam with at some company where, where the sales cycle is stalled or team can introduce prospective team members, you know, sales, tech, strategic partners, distribution partners. There's somebody in the P it's, it's the breadth of the PAA network. It's also a prominent network too. I mean, these Princeton alumni aren't chopped liver. I mean, they're, they're very, uh, you know, accomplished people by and large. And there's usually somebody in that group that, that can- If you can help their sales, they'll always talk to you. Yeah, yeah, it anybody, yeah, yeah, sales is a big thing. If you, yeah. can, if you can bring customers, can they'll talk to you, even if you're a small, even if you're not an investor. Mm -hmm. And you, you have that intro because you are an investor, you know somebody at the company, you can, you can reach out to them. And I know you don't have the benefit of being able to speak at monthly or quarterly board meetings, but you do have, you do have the ability to reach out to your contact at the company and just ask that question I asked in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the deck, how can I help? What do you need? And often they'll ask you the, the quarterly, as I said, the quarterly emails that come out for their new newsletters will have specific asks for their investor base. Um, but if they're not asking you, you should ask them, uh, how, can, how can we help? And you'll be surprised. There's a lot of things you can do. Yeah. And just following up, the very last question, because we're going to close is, when you um, inside letters or you're, on, you're, you're working on an early stage investment through a safe, what sort of information rights do you ask for? And you know, what, on what frequency in terms of reporting, we always have these debates and what, are sort of, what do you think is best practices in that area in terms of a follow on from the companies and what right. we should ask for? Well, as a general rule, I try not to be annoying because we're, we're like PAA, we're small investors. And I don't want to have a, a burdensome set of uh, reporting rights in in the side letter. So typically, it would be um, it would be something that they're already preparing for the board. So I, I would ask for their monthly board pack, um, which would contain their unaudited monthly financial statements. Um, if they if they do quarterly board meetings in, in lieu of that, I'll take quarterly financials. Um, I'd I'd want access to Carta, so I could check the cap table out at any time I want. Um, I, I want the, I would have in those rights the ability to uh, at reasonable times and for reasonable amounts of time to access the management team to ask questions. Um, in the old days, I would have asked to be able to visit their facility, but so many so many companies are distributed right now that there's no real you know facility that you could one facility you could visit and get a lot of information about. But but if they do seem to have a central loc locale, you can ask if you could visit the office. Uh, you know again at reasonable times and a reasonable notice. That, that would be the, oh, one last thing. I, I want, I'd want access to the budget as well. And sometimes, so, sorry, if you're asking, yeah. sometimes I, I also ask for their dashboard of KPIs. It usually a company, if they don't have a dashboard of KPIs, that's another value add to the prior question, uh, to that person's question. Um, you can help the company, you should help the company work with them to develop KPIs. Because one of the most important things is, is you know, we have to be able to measure ourselves, measure our, pro are we making progress? Are we, are, we, are we flatlining? What are we doing here? Uh, and it's not exactly all measured in terms of, of, uh, of revenue uh, in ARR and, IR, ARR and MRR. It can also be measured in certain milestones that, that are critical. And getting that big distributor signed up and training that, that team's distribution team, et cetera. Well, Ed, I really, on behalf of my co-chairs, uh, Rick, Lawrence, and Christine, on behalf of all of us in the audience and those that couldn't make it who will watch this, uh, on video, uh, I, we're incredibly indebted to you for your perspective, your insights, your experience, and um, the time that you've taken 
you and actually Joyce. So we want to thank your wife, who's, who's so integral to, to everything you guys do. Uh, uh, but everything the two of you in a gallery about, that was answering questions in the background. That was yeah, that was Joyce. But um, we are incredibly appreciative. We I know I know Rick has been a friend for decades, and we hope that you will continue to be a, a friend and a partner with PA in the future. We we would love to have you back, and just. Uh, just please accept our tremendous gratitude for everything that you've shared with us tonight. It was wonderful and really helpful. And it was uh, really great to have you and your wife here tonight and, and actually your parents as well. <laughs> well, you're missing my sons and my dog, but if you want to hold on, I can get yeah. them. <laughs> Listen, thank, thank you very much for having me. I, I, it was very kind of you to invite me and um, I, I enjoyed uh, putting together the slides and I hope, uh, I hope it was worthwhile. Um, to spend time um, uh, going through them. Uh, and I also hope that we can collaborate on other investments like Serotype. Well, we're excited about Serotype and um, you obviously get good deal flow uh, through CIF and other sources. Your, your network, the, the alumni network is a great uh, deal sourcing uh, dyna uh, dynamic. So we hope to collaborate with you more and um, you know, please uh, show us anything you're interested in and we'll, we'll do likewise. Yeah, we would welcome that opportunity. So thank you again. And to all those who stuck with us for an hour and a half in the audience, so thank all of you for joining us tonight and have a, have a really good night. We will send around the recordings and slides to people that registered. And then and, and when it comes in about half an hour, I'll get that to you and Joyce as well. So thank you very much and good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.